Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. If you have a young child who is from the ages 0 to 3, I believe, uh, if you would like to have some uh, help with the attendant nursery, you can at this time exit the back, go to the right, and go into the nursery and have uh, child care there for you so you can um, focus in on Ephesians chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 uh, together this morning. The Christian home, reflecting the body of Christ. Paul has been walking through this letter, uh, the letter of Ephesians, been focusing on the identity of the church as the body of Christ and all the implications of what that means uh, for us. And as we enter into chapter 5, verse 21, into the beginning of chapter 6, he's going to shift his focus to really zeroing in on the Christian home. Specifically, he's going to be talking about marriage. He's going to be talking about the relationship between parents and children. He's also going to be talking about our own workplace, the, uh, the, the relationship between employer and, and employee. But I want us to note, before we begin any of this, that Paul has a greater purpose for this section. Oftentimes, it's easy for us to treat this as an aside. Paul's been talking about some very lofty things for a while, and then he kind of gets on a rant about the Christian family, and then he comes back to talk about spiritual warfare. But this is all connected. This is all essential for our understanding of what it means to be the church. And that is that the Christian home, the Christian family that God has designed, is an opportunity to reflect what God is doing in the church, to reflect the body of Christ. So let's think about some of these things together this morning. Before we get to our text, let me open up my notes. I want to refer to some wisdom found in Toy Story. The first Toy Story. You are a toy. You aren't the real Buzz Lightyear. You're an, you're, a, you're an action figure. You're a child's plaything. In Toy Story 1, Woody the cowboy is the leader of Andy's toys. He's comfortable and he's secure in his routine and in his position. He's used to being Andy's favorite toy. He's used to being the one in charge and everything revolving around him. That is until the famous Buzz Lightyear enters the scene, the flashy new space ranger. He comes in and he becomes Andy's first, uh, Andy's favorite toy, and his arrival threatens Woody's status and his position as the leader of the toys, the leader of the group, and sparks a fierce rivalry between the two. See, they're obsessed with who's in charge. They're obsessed with who is holding on to power. And this obsession over status leads to conflict, to jealousy, and to strife. But of course, as the story unfolds and progresses, Woody and Buzz go through a transformation of sorts. They find themselves in some precarious situations where they must rely on each other to survive and to achieve their common goal of returning to Andy and leading the toys home. And through these trials, they learn to appreciate each other's strengths and to submit to one another's leadership when needed. And their journey teaches them the value of relying on one another, on mutual submission, setting aside their pride and desire for control to work together for the greater good. There's a lot of themes, a lot of stories that come out in some of the simplest forms, right? I find myself all the time watching a movie or a TV show or reading a book with, with Patsy and realizing, wow, there's a lot more to this. You know, wow, I'm, I'm learning something here. And one of the things we see in this simple example is what is highlighted is a central issue and a central problem that's common to all human beings. And that is pride. That is the desire for status, the desire to be Recognize who exactly is in charge here and how do we respond when our sense of position, our role, our routine, or our status is being challenged. Ever since the beginning, all the way in Genesis, we have struggled with power and with making a name for ourselves. And we see this play out in some of the most intimate and most important relationships. We see this play out in power dynamics within our own families and with our own closest friends. Who exactly is in charge? 
Who makes the decisions? It can create tension in our marriage, our relationship with our parents and children, in our connection with good friends. We see this in the workplace, between employer and employee, with coworkers, who's getting the next promotion, who's in charge here, do it my way, my way or the highway. We see this even in our own church community. Who is in charge here? And how do we respond when we don't get our way? The text that was just read for us reframes everything. Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is above all, who created all, lowers himself to the point of servant. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so among you. Whoever, whoever would be great among you must be servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He completely turns power dynamics upside down. He says, if you want to be great, if you want to make your name great, if you want to be somebody, be nobody. If you want to be somebody, lower yourself to the position of a servant, to the slave of all. But I don't know if I can do that, Jesus. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to lower himself, to give his life as a ransom for many. He is our master. He's our Lord. He's our example. He's our teacher. And we should follow his set example and pick up our own cross and die to ourselves. Power dynamics are completely reversed in Jesus. Completely reversed in Jesus. And this gets at the heart of what we're going to think about together in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul tucks away this little and loaded verse here in verse 21. He says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That we are to submit ourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now we talked about this just a little bit the last time we were in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5. But as a reminder, this verse is connected to the verses that precede it. There's a string of four participles that are connected together that all are under the umbrella of verse 18. When he, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Do you remember this in verse 18? When he tells the church to be filled with the Spirit, that the church is the Spirit-filled body of Christ as we walk and we talk and we are Christ's continued presence here on earth. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, part of it is to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, verse 19. To sing and make melody in our hearts, verse 19. To give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our, lead, of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 20. And then verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That if the church is going to be the spirit-filled body of Christ, then the church must be made of, of people who are willing to submit to one another. Now, what in the world does this look like? How does, how does a church, how, how can we just all submit to one another? Surely there's a decision maker here, right? Surely there's an order, right? There's... But here's the heart of it all, that we are to be people who are willing to lower ourselves underneath one another, which is what the word submission literally means, to be placed under. And it's a voluntary act of lowering oneself and exalting others as more important than ourselves. Paul hints at this and really focuses in on this in Philippians chapter uh, 2, when he says that we should follow example of Jesus, have the mind, this mind is yours in Christ Jesus, who did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but rather he lowered himself to the, to the point of, of a servant, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that's why he can say that we should consider others as more important than ourselves, because we are to be people who are submitting ourselves to others. That if we are to submit ourselves to King Jesus out of reverence for Christ, that means we're going to be like Christ and submit ourselves to one another. So what exactly is submission? Biblical submission is the act of selflessly yielding one's personal preferences, desires, and will to another, mirroring the example of Christ. There's a lot of ways we could define submission, but I think this is a good one. It's the act of selflessly yielding one's personal preferences, desires, and wills to another, Mirroring the example of Christ. If it's good enough for Jesus, 
It's good enough for us as well. Tim Keller writes in this little book called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Uh, he's reflecting on the theme of humility and pride, and he's actually reflecting on C.S. Lewis's work in Mere Christianity, but here's what he writes. He says about a humble person, he says, if we were to meet a truly humble person, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us that they are nobody because a person who keeps saying that they are nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Thinking of myself less. Sometimes we foster a false sense of humility. Well, I'm just a nobody. I'm just, I'm nothing. I'm just, woe is me. And, and that can be very prideful. We may not think of it as pride, but it's still focusing on ourself. But gospel humility, he says, is thinking of myself less, willing to submit my own desires, my own preferences, my own will to another, following the example of Jesus. So as we get into our text this morning, Paul is going to shift his attention to the Christian home. But I don't want us to lose sight of the big picture here, that God has created the family on purpose for a purpose. And what we're going to see is that if we are going to learn how to submit ourselves, we need, we need to learn how to submit ourselves in our most important relationships. And if we do that, we have the opportunity to reflect the body of Christ, the church. So Paul takes a glance at the Christian home, and he's going to consider marriage, he's going to consider parenting, and he's going to consider work, but his goal is to demonstrate how mutual submission, submitting to one another in our most important relationships, will have a bigger effect of modeling Christ's relationship with the church to a watching world. Family is good. Family is important. God has created our families on purpose for a purpose. But if we're not careful, we can make family an idol. We can make family about family. When family is created to point a watching world to Jesus. As we mirror in our relationships, God's relationship to his church. So let's zoom in for a few moments and think about these three categories, these three places. And then we'll come back out and have a concluding point together. So let's think about marriage for a moment. What does mutual submission look like in a relationship between a husband and a wife? Mutual submission, lowering oneself in a marriage relationship, is demonstrated when husbands lovingly lead their wives and wives respectfully follow their husbands. This is what Paul says in chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now it's important to say at the front of this text that this has been historically misused, abused, and weaponized for centuries to completely invert the purpose Paul has here of demonstrating what a humble, submissive, sacrificial marriage looks like. And it's been used and weaponized to focus on oneself, particularly by husbands and men who don't feel like they're getting their way and are commanding their wives to submit to them. And it's important for us to realize, men and husbands, that Paul's not speaking to us yet. He's speaking to wives. And this is about their relationship with the Lord as they submit as to the Lord. So what exactly is he saying here? Now, you may not want to know this because I'm going to get into the weeds just a little bit. Um, but I think it's helpful for us to understand that the word submit that I've highlighted in green in verse 22, that word is not in this verse in Greek. The Greek word submit is not here because Paul is picking it up from the previous verse. Now, I know I'm getting into the weeds. You may not care about language here. 
But it's important for us to understand that literally this says that we are to sub submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, verse 21. And then he says, wives to your own husbands. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because the relationships that we have in our marriages are intrinsically connected to our relationships in the church. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can try to create this barrier and this we try to put our family in this private sphere over here and the church in our private sphere over here and the workplace in our private sphere over here. But what Paul's doing is demonstrating how our most important relationships are being used by God to strengthen and to build up the body of Christ. And that a wife's submission to her husband is intrinsically connected to all of our command to submit to one another. So wives, submit to your own husbands. He says, as to the Lord, your ultimate allegiance, the one to you ultimately submit to. And why should you do this? So it's for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So what does it mean for a wife to submit to her husband? There's a lot that we could say here, but let me begin by saying what it is not. Submission is not that one is weaker spiritually. I've met many, many women and wives who are much spiritually, are spiritually stronger than their husbands. It's not that one is to be spiritually passive. Wives are to take an active role in the spiritual life of their family and marriage. And it certainly does not mean staying in an abusive situation because abuse is not synonymous with submission. Nor submission mean that you cannot have an opinion, cannot disagree, and it's certainly not licensed to disobey the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That he is your ultimate king. He is your Lord. That's who you have your ultimate allegiance and the one to whom you're ultimately submitting to. And so wives are to voluntarily submit to their husbands because of the headship responsibility God has entrusted to husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, what exactly does headship mean? Now, Paul doesn't really explain it here, but he does in other places. He does in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and following. Also in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 through 13. And in these texts, Paul is rooting the headship of men in the ordering of creation. That in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, God has designed the world with a certain order, a creational order. And that headship is not about hierarchy or tyranny, but is about responsibility. In other words, the male has been, is the firstborn and has the firstborn responsibility of the family to lead, to protect, to provide. So this has nothing to do with status or worth, but about role. And God has given unique complementary roles to men and women. And I think that's really important for us to understand because our culture is really trying to conflate our roles and our uniqueness. One author writes, of course, the sexes are equal before God, but this does not mean that they are identical. And I'm very thankful for that. God himself created us male and female in his likeness. So both equally bear his image, but each also complements the other. The biblical perspective is to hold simultaneously the quality and the complementarity of the sexes. So if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, one of the first things that goes wrong, quote unquote, with creation is when God looks at Adam and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. The fall hasn't happened yet. But he says, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not complete yet. So I'm going to make a helper that is suitable for him. And this word helper is used elsewhere, especially in the Psalms, uh, as an image for God, who is Israel's helper. Who is this, it's, this, it's a military term for uh, help coming over the hill to save the day, so to speak. That I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And that through their union, they will... Both bear the image of God for the world. And so that's what Paul does firstly, is he appeals to creation for this ordering of relationships. 
that husbands are the head of their wife because God has created order in our relationships with one another as a whole and within our family. But then he appeals to Jesus. And this is what Paul's really focusing on. In 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2, he's really focusing on creation. But here he's focusing on the example of Jesus. And this is really important for us to understand. Paul says that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, if you remember, weeks ago, we've covered a little bit of what it means for Christ to be the head of the church. Look at verse 15 and 16 of chapter 4 with me in Ephesians. I don't have it on the screen. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, Paul is talking about the building up of the body of Christ and how God has gifted unique roles, leadership roles to the church in order for the equipping of the saints for the works of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. He continues that image of Christ's body by looking to the head of the body, Jesus. In verse 15 and 16 of Ephesians 4, Paul says this, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom... The whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So as the head of the body, Jesus does not abuse his body and does not use his body to meet his own needs. Rather, he nourishes and cherishes his body and provides for his body. He grows the body, he unites the body, and he builds it up in love. His headship expresses care rather than control, responsibility rather than rule. And it's that type of headship that God has entrusted to men, to husbands. And it's that type of headship that Paul is commanding wives to submit to, to place themselves voluntarily and respectfully under, because this is how God has ordered creation. Now, as I said, he's been talking to wives, but men, it's our turn. He changes and he pivots in verse 25 to begin to talk about husbands. And this is where things get interesting, because up to this point, maybe we're like, okay, this makes sense, uh, but I want you to feel, as he talks to husbands, as he talks to fathers in a moment, and he talks to masters in chapter 6, as he begins to talk to those who have a certain amount of authority in their role, he completely counterculturally inverts everything to where you have a completed circle of mutual submission. So, so here's what he says in verse 25. Husbands, he says, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. He's not losing sight of the big picture. We are members of his body. Quote, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I don't want us to miss how absolutely countercultural this image was for Paul and it still is for us. Paul speaks reasonably and rationally to wives submitting to their own husband because of the way God has ordered creation, headship. But now he turns it on his head and he completes the circle. Yes, wives are to submit to their husbands, but husbands are also to submit to their wives. Not in the same way, but in the laying down and in the submission of their own life. 
They are to love their wives like Christ loved the church who gave himself up for her. Jesus laid it all down for his bride. He went to the cross for his bride. That's not any type of love. That's Calvary love. That's a love that's willing to go to whatever length is necessary for the life and the, and the betterment of one's bride. And that's the type of love that husbands are commanded to, to share and to give to their wives. A love that is a submissive love. Not inverting or not eradicating the order of the relationships. Not punting headship. But is completing the circle by saying, we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21. What does this look like in marriage? This looks like a wife who is respectfully following her husband and a husband who is not just any type of love, but Calgary love leading in love in their marriage. So I want to ask you a question, husbands, a reflection question. What kind of man is God asking your wife to submit to? Would you submit to that kind of person? Well, when we start talking like that, Jeff, you're starting to step on my toes a little bit, right? Well, I'm stepping on my, on my own toes. And that's a hard reflection question. What kind of man is God asking your wife to submit to? And is that the kind of person you would submit to? But this is what God, through Paul, is expecting for our marriage relationships. In a world that's filled with proud, arrogant, self-centered men, it's time for us husbands to stand up and to die like men. Die to self. Calgary love. A husband that is willing to be crucified with Christ is also crucified for his wife. Did you know that? That we are not just crucified with Christ, but to be crucified with Christ, according to Paul, is to be crucified for our wives. And that's a completely different type of love. This is not a self-centered love. This is a self-sacrificial love. And it's this kind of love that demonstrates what mutual submission looks like between husband and wife. I want to read to you a quote by John Stott. And it's a little lengthy, but I think it really summarizes everything we've just said. So, so bear with me here. This is what John Stott writes about this. He says, what Paul stresses is not, talking about for the husband, is not the husband's authority over his wife, but his love for her. So when he pivots to the husbands, he could be talking about, okay, this is what headship looks like, so leading this way, leading this way. This isn't a leadership book. This is a love book, right? Lower yourself. Die to self. So he doesn't stress his authority over his wife, but his love for her. Instead, his authority is defined in terms of loving responsibility. To our minds, the word authority suggests power, dominion, and even oppression. And we see that abused all the time in our culture. We picture the authoritative husband as a domineering figure who makes all the decisions himself, issues commands, and expects obedience, inhibits and suppresses his wife, and so prevents her from growing into a mature and fulfilled person. But this is not at all the kind of headship which the apostle is describing, whose model is Jesus Christ. Certainly, headship implies a degree of leadership and initiative, as when Christ came to woo and to win his bride, but more specifically, it implies sacrifice, self-giving for the sake of the beloved, as when Christ gave himself for his bride. If headship means power in any sense, then it is the power to care, not to crush. The power to serve, not to dominate. Power to facilitate self-fulfillment, not to frustrate or destroy it. And in all this, the standard of the husband's love is to be the cross of Christ, on which he surrendered himself even to death in his selfless love for his bride. What a tall order, right? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And in the verse 32, it says, this mystery is profound. As he quotes Genesis, he says, this is all about Christ and the church. This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. That when, when people see a marriage that is mutually submissive, one where the wife is respectfully following her husband 
and the husband is laying down his life for his wife, a watching world sees Jesus. Did you know that? What a powerful image. So this is more than just about marriage. This isn't just Paul's marriage tips for the Christians in Ephesus. This is all about the body of Christ. And if we live out our marriages in the way God's designed them, then that has an impact on the growth and the development and the mission of the church. So then Paul shifts to parents and children. And this is what we're going to see, that mutual submission involves children obeying their parents and parents tenderly raising their children in the Lord. Mutual submission involves children obeying their parents and parents tenderly, we're going to highlight that word in just a moment, raising their children in the Lord. So as we move into chapter 6, this is what Paul says. Children, let's pause. Children were a nuisance in the ancient world. Children were to be pushed aside. They were annoying. They are to be seen and not heard. Maybe we've heard that before. And what does Jesus say? No, 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 no. Let the little children come to me. And the fact that Paul is addressing children in this letter to the Christians in Ephesus means that the church is living out the teachings of Jesus. That children have dignity and they are worthy of being addressed. Have you ever thought about that? But he's addressing and he's writing to children. And he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Quote, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The discipline and instruction of the Lord. So Paul quotes Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 from the Ten Commandments, and he also attaches Deuteronomy 5, 16, and he combines them together to instruct what these relationships look like in the church. So why should children obey their parents? Well, the first reason, before he ever quotes scripture, he says, for this is right. Enough said, right? This is right, or your version might say, this is righteous, like this is good, This is how God's designed these relationships to work. And if you look throughout human history, at at human civilizations, civilizations throughout history have recognized the importance of parental authority for a stable society. Whether it be a Christian society or a pagan society, for the most part, a society that's rooted with a parental authoritative structure where children are raised properly leads to stability in that society. And that's why we see some of the, th- the most egregious sins that God addresses in the Old Testament is when a society begins the practice of child sacrifice. It is so polluted and inverted from God's design for how the family is to run. So this is something written in our hearts. We also see it in the wisdom of Scripture. It's one of the great, it's in the Big Ten, right? Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the, in the land. But remember this phrase. It says, obey your parents in the Lord. Jesus has some hard teaching in Matthew chapter 10, because he recognizes when the gospel comes, it has the power to act like a sword. Not that he wants it to act like a sword, but it has the power to act like a sword and to divide families, to divide families. Because for some people and for some children, they have to make one of the hardest decisions ever, and that is to choose to place their allegiance into King Jesus against the will and the wishes and the desires of their parents. And that is hard. I've I've talked to several people who, in tears, are at this crisis point. It's like, I've got to choose this or that. I've got to choose submitting myself to Jesus or submitting myself to my parents. And ultimately... Your ultimate allegiance is always to Jesus. That's why we obey our parents in the Lord. But God has created the family, and in general, he has entrusted parents with the authority to guide, to form, and to shape their children in him. But then he pivots in verse 4 to fathers. He focuses on fathers as the head of the house, but this certainly includes mothers as well. The context demands it. It says, obey your parents plural, 
honor your father and mother. But he really zeroes in on fathers in verse 4 because in Roman culture, the father was, had absolute, complete power over his entire family. The pater familias was his title. That he had complete, I mean, the law was in his own hands. So for context, uh, William Barclay, he writes that a Roman father had absolute power over his family. Get this. He says he could sell them as slaves. He can make them work in his fields, even in chains. He could take the law into his own hands, for the law was his own hands, and punish as he liked. And, and note this, he says, he could even inflict the death penalty on his child. Now, we live in a very different time, right? We have a lot of structures in place to prevent this type of thing happening. But in, in Roman culture, the father, the head of the house, had complete control and power and could even put his own child to death if he went against his will and his, against his wishes. And it's in that type of context that Paul writes, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. What? What do you, what do you mean, Paul? I have, I have my rights, you know. <laughs> I have my rights to, to slap these kids upside the head when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This word, to bring up, uh, can also be translated to, to nourish. It was just used in chapter 5, verse 29, when he says, talking about he who nourishes his own body. In the same way, it says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but nourish them. Bring them up, feed them, water them, grow them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline is more than correction, but it definitely includes correction. And children need boundaries. Children need correction. Uh, children need to learn what not to do. But they're also to learn what they should do and the ways they should go. And so discipline can also be translated as, as training. The Olympics are going on at this time. We think about all the training involved with an Olympic athlete. In the same way, parents and fathers are to train their children. Faith takes practice. And it starts in the home. And that's why Deuteronomy chapter 6 is rooted in as you rise, as you fall, as you lie down, as you go. Wherever you find yourself, you are to share these things and, and instruct these things and discipline and train your children. And we are to instruct our children as well. And this is specifically talking about verbal instruction. That we are to educate our children's hearts and our minds with the word of God and the story of Jesus. It's not enough just to be a moral example for your child. You got to say something. This is what the world, this, this is who God is. And this is what he's done in Jesus. And this is why you're created. And this is the purpose and value you have in the Lord. And this is completely upside down from Roman culture where children are just pushed to the side. And once you, once you have something to contribute to the, to the, uh, to the home, and then you, then you can come and then you can say something. No, bring them up, train them, instruct them. Parents, if the only thing you give your child is Jesus, you give them everything. You know, we live in a world that's chasing wind. And I think about all the things I, all the desires and the hopes and dreams I have for my two little girls, six and two. Um, I want them to explore the world. I want them to learn how to use their hands. Um, I want them to, you know, take learn instruments and learn languages and take sports and recreation and all these things. We live in a beautiful state. I want them to explore um, God's creation. But if they don't have Jesus, they don't have anything. But if they have Jesus, no matter if they go to school or not, if they go to college or not, no matter if they have a high-paying job or a low-paying job, none of it matters. It's like if they have Jesus, they have everything. And it doesn't stop when we turn 18. Because I, I know families are hard. We continue to pray. We continue to discipline. We continue to instruct in the Lord. But mutual submission in these relationships involves children obeying their parents in the Lord and parents tenderly raising their children in the Lord. And then lastly, as we move to verse 5 and following to verse 9, it begins to talk about the workplace. It says, mutual submission involves employees and employers working and serving with sincerity. Now, we're running out of time. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this point, but here's what I want us to read here. 
Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bond servant or is free. And then he says, Masters, verse 9, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So he goes from marriage and then he goes to parents and children and now he begins to talk about the workplace. And this is very challenging for many of us to get our minds around because for many of us, the workplace is outside of the home. We go to work and then we retreat at home, right? But that wasn't the case in the ancient world. 99.9% .9 of the work was in the home. You, your economic base was what your family produced from your home. So it was all together. Bond servants typically lived under the same roof as a wife and as children. And so he's speaking to people who are in the church in Ephesus, who are in Christ in Ephesus, and about these relationships. And I wish we would have enough time to really dive into this word bondservant. If you'd like to know, talk more about it, we can talk more about it afterwards. Um, but this word doulos can be translated um, in a wide range. It can be translated as a general voluntary servant when Jesus gets on his knees and he washes feet. It can also be described, used to describe a, a slave who was a slave um, not by choice, thinking about uh, metaphorically in Romans chapter 6 where we are a slave to sin, but we've been made a slave to Christ. But it can also be used in a general term as it's being used here as a bond servant, as a all sorts of levels of um, servitude in the Roman world. Paul's not condoning the institution of slavery here. If you'd like to talk more about that, we can. Um, but I want you to notice that the bond servant was a major, major part of the home in Roman culture. They estimate, I was staggered by this, they estimate that during the time of this writing, there was approximately 60 million bond servants in Rome. 60 million. There were some cities where you had more servants than free people. Just as a point of reference, that's two times the total population of the United States before the Civil War, and just in servants. So that's a large, large, and that is the, that is the essence of the, of the uh, workforce in Rome. It would include domestic servants, it would include manual laborers, it would also include doctors and teachers, administrators, one could acquire a bondservant through inheritance, through purchase, through a settlement of bad debt, or even a prisoner of war. So this is an integrated part of the Christian home in Ephesus that Paul is addressing. And notice what he does. He calls for mutual submiss submission between master and bondservant. Servants are to serve with sincerity, as they are ultimately bondservants of Jesus. They are given dignity. He addresses them just like he addressed children. But also, masters are to treat their servants in the same way. Don't assume because you have the money that you have more value. Treat them with dignity. Treat them with respect. Why? Because there's no partiality between you and Jesus. What a statement. Now, it might be easy for us to skip past this section as we don't have this type of cultural context anymore. And most of our work, as I said, is outside of the home. But I want you to notice this application. Don't let money be an excuse to not submit yourself to someone else. Money is never, ever an excuse to treat anybody as anything less than being created in the image of God. There is no partiality with our master. We are all equal before him. And that's what it looks like to submit to one another. So work for your employers with integrity and sincerity, even if they don't treat you fairly. Treat your employees with fairness and gentleness. And at the end of the day, there's no partiality with our master. So we've talked about marriage. We've talked about parenting. We've talked about our work. But let's zoom back out as we come to a close. Why is Paul talking about this? Paul's talking about this because the mission of the church begins in our homes.
Our homes are not just for our enjoyment. It is that. The home is not just for a place for us to retreat and rest. It is that. Our homes are designed on purpose for a purpose. And that is because the mission of the church begins in our most important relationships. And if I can't submit myself to my family, then how in the world am I going to serve the Lord in the church and in the world? If I can't submit my own, if I can't, if I can't demonstrate humility in my most important relationships, then how can I expect to do that here? We are to mutually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In our marriage, in our relationship with our parents, in our relationship with our children, and in our workplace. The mission of the church begins at home. So this whole series has been about understanding the identity of the body of Christ. And the reason Paul moves to the Christian home is to demonstrate how the family is a model or is a microcosm of the church. That ideally a watching world as they look into your home should learn more about Jesus. The Christian family is created on purpose for a purpose to reflect the body of Christ. And if we can learn how to submit in our most important relationships, we have an opportunity to reflect Christ's body to a watching world. So Paul has lifted up a lofty picture of what family should look like. But I know in this room this morning, we have a whole, all sorts of different types of family. And some of our families, we've experienced a lot of joy, a lot of gratitude, a lot of thanksgiving. But some of our families, we haven't. We've experienced pain. We've experienced broken trust. We've experienced um, confusion and brokenness. We have nuclear, nuclear families. We have blended families. We have single parent families. We have parents living with adult children. We have marriages with no children. And we have people who are living very far from their families and all sorts of different types of families that I didn't include. So wherever you find your family this morning, let me challenge you and offer a challenge in two ways. First, remember that your family is designed to point people to Jesus. You can start wherever you are. Whatever your family looks like, know that it doesn't just exist for you. That God can and God will use your family to point people to Jesus. And the question is, will you let him? The mission of the church begins in your home, whatever your home looks like. And secondly, in all of your most important relationships, in your marriage, in your relationship with your children, with your parents, and in your workplace, etc., in what way or in what ways might you need to submit yourself, to lower yourself? In what ways do you need to serve and to love another? It's not always easy, for none of our relationships are perfect. But as far as it depends on you, how can today and this week, can you submit yourself in your most important relationships? And remember that we can only properly submit ourselves to one another if we have submitted ourselves to Christ. For he is our king. He is our Lord. He is the one that has ordered our relationships. And he is the one that is using our families for his purpose and for his mission. So this morning, if there's any way that we can pray for you, if there's any way we can pray for your family, if there's any way you would like to respond to the word of God, if you'd like to become a Christian this morning and to commit your ultimate allegiance to King Jesus by dying to yourself and being buried and being raised to walk in newness of life, if we can love you in any way, come now as we stand and sing our invitation song.